Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today, we're having a fun conversation with one of our heroes, Mr. Luis Molinet, who is the ENI product manager at Araco. Luis, how are you doing today? I am doing pretty good, Chris. Thanks. How are you doing? I am doing good, man. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Really looking forward to talking with you. Luis, you got a, a, a very unique background and, and work history. I know you're going to bring so much value to our listeners. So maybe we always like to start the hero episodes off with explaining a little bit about the, your personal journey. So could you do that for us? Sure. So I'm Luis Molinet. I'm uh, originally from Chile in South America. I'm 39 years old, married with uh, three kids, 10, uh, six, and three years old. So I would say my journey started back around 1996 when I kind of fell in love with the electronic world. I studied uh, electronics in the technical high school where I was studying at in Concepcion, my hometown in, in Chile, which is around 500 kilometers to the south of uh, Santiago, the capital of Chile. And then after that, I uh, transitioned to college where I studied electronic engineering, specifically in Universidad de Concepción, Concepción University in, again, Concepción. Then after I finished that, where my specialty kind of became automation with a little power electronics, with the basic of motors, generators, those kind of stuff. I um, started my professional life with Arauco in Chile. Arauco is a Chilean company. And I started as trainee engineer uh, with, with the company where basically the company paid me for a little over a year just to learn. So that was kind of sweet. And over time I became electrical supervisor for the maintenance area in the plant I worked at at the time. And over the time I, you know, I started learning about the process, the equipment, how to and I put into practice all the theory that I learned over the, I would say, nine years of study, combining college and high school. Over time, when Arauco started the journey of manufacturing in the U.S., I was proposed to come up here. So at the time, I came just with my wife and my uh, daughter. She was two and a half years old, and now we're five in the house. So it's been a... Interesting journey. Uh, when I started with Arauco here in the U.S., it was on the maintenance role. And over time, I moved over the engineering side where I can still can still enjoy the field work, combining with improvements from electrical, electronic, automation standpoint. And believe it or not, I've actually been into the field of purchasing forklifts. So I've been from installing protection relays, adding new areas to the plant, adding new production lines to purchasing forklifts just to move material in and out. So it's kind of a wide, I don't know, field of expertise, if you can call it that way. And definitely a wide field of expertise, man. I mean, so from purchasing to engineering. So are you on the project side primarily right now? That is correct. I am the project side where we basically are in charge of executing capital investment for the for the plant. I'm not going to say for the company because I'm just dedicated to the plant that I work at. I support every once in a while the other plants that Rocco has in the East Coast. But yeah, we we develop and we give you know basic thoughts when we request uh, outside engineering for different different purposes. And also I support maintenance when maintenance needs something based on my experience. 
Okay, very good. Well, well, Luis, I think you, you know, with, with your background, touching on many areas that a lot of our listeners either are in or hope to be in, you know, and, and, and you have a unique perspective to, from a manufacturing standpoint, what are the, the challenges right now that you see, you know, to your vertical of industry that you're in? You know, what do you see that? I'm, and with COVID, that may be changing. I'm just curious on what your take is on, on from a challenge standpoint. So with the, with the COVID-19 situation, first of all, is trying to stay in business. That's kind of the primary goal for everybody. And the next one is trying to be more efficient in our way to operate, whether it is from raw material procurement or from in the way how we purchase or in the way how we produce, in the way how we use electrical energy, stuff like that. Okay. Very good. So, I mean, that, that sounds like some very important areas to focus on. I mean, is, is there one in particular that stands out with that from the biggest challenge from your standpoint? I am in the final stage of improving the protection relay scheme for the power distribution system of the plant. So I know with that, one, I am bringing up to, up to date the protection system. We're not changing most of the equipment, but we're, we're, change, we're changing the protective devices. And with that, we're going to have the chance to measure and quantify the electrical energy we're using to make our product. So then, for sure, we can put a dollar value from the electrical standpoint on how much we're spending. And from that, once you have the information, you can manage it. Oh, very good. Okay, so tie it all back together. I mean, it's, that's right. that's great. That is great. So when you're trying to to research some of these projects, what are some resources that you typically use in that process? Well, it it depends on when the project starts at. Sometimes we, as an engineer, engineering team, we bring to the table certain thoughts or ideas on how to improve certain areas whether it's environmentally, safety, or um, efficiency in the, in the process. Or sometimes we just are given with the idea that comes from upper management, whether it's at the plant level or still could be even higher from that. And then we start bringing it to the ground, trying to understand what the situation, what we want to do, and then see if we need outside resources, let's say, mechanical design, civil design, chemical design sometimes, or uh, uh, some other areas of the engineering that we currently don't have in the the plant. Okay, very good. So talk to us about some projects. What gets you excited, man? I know you're involved in so many new things. What gets you amped up? I think when... uh, a little going back in, into the, the background, when I is kind of my biggest field of expertise, still automation. So one of the things that I loved at the time and I still do love now is when I'm able to click on a screen and I see the physical effect of that action. You know, the transition from just the bits and bytes whether it's an HMI, computer, PLC, and then see it in action, moving a piece of equipment, making a motor to spin. Also sharing my, my, uh, my knowledge, my experience with people. I come from a, a family of teachers. Um, both of my parents were, were teachers, both retired now. So it's kind of naturally me in the way how I do things that even though I might not want to do it in that way, I'm sharing my knowledge. I'm, I'm teaching somehow what I, what I know, what I do. Well, I think we, we, we call that, and I've heard that brought up here on this, this show before, pay it forward. And you take, you know, you take that knowledge and you, you know, if you have a heart of a teacher, you're, you're going to just relay that to others. So hats off to you. Cause one thing we're hearing from a challenge standpoint in industry is you know the knowledge is leaving, and if the not if the knowledge leaves and there's nobody there to build up the next the next group, that's a tough spot to be in, Luis. It is, it is, and uh, and unfortunately, in uh, in manufacturing, 
um, there's no enough resources to keep all the documentation that we should. So you cannot say, yeah, I mean, if this person leaves, we can just back and read all these manuals, SOPs that were written back in the time or developed by that person. Still, there's not enough of that. So it's always a good to me. I mean, j just because it's not, well, I, I, mean, I don't think that in the way kind of, you know, it's a practice or a, a good practice from a company standpoint that you have to um, share your knowledge. To me, it's just kind of what I do. <laughs> right. Well, it makes you a good leader is what it does. It really does. And, you know, if we're trying to inspire people as well with, with Eco SY and all our different types of listeners. If, there, if there's somebody out there who, who is wanting to get in manufacturing and is, who is interested in getting to that e and field, what's some advice you, that you'd offer up to, to, that, to that young person that, okay, I wish I'd have known this starting my career? I, when I started, to me, it was natural. And I noticed after, uh, you know, a couple of years after I started with, with the company that I saw some other uh, trainee engineers coming on board that they thought because they came out of college, they knew everything so they could do whatever they wanted in the way how probably they did in a lab environment. One of the things that I did when I started with a, uh, with Arauca was okay. I started six years down down there. The, the, the career that I chose lasts for for uh, six years. So I started six years. I know a lot of theory. Um, I've done some practical things, but the monster that I'm looking at now it doesn't compare with what I've done. So I kind of need to put into practice what I've learned. Learning what I'm seeing in front of me, taking into account the experience of the people that I'm supposed to manage, the people that I'm supposed to supervise. So it was a uh, interesting, interesting way to approach. And I think over a short period of time, I'm, I'm glad to say that I, I learned or I earned the respect from, from the people that at the end I started, you know, managing. Okay, so what maybe what were some of the, the key things that helped you in that process? Respecting their experience, basically. Knowing that they knew what they were doing, they might uh, have not known the exact background or the exact way, let's say, how that thing worked, but taking into consideration that they had been doing that for, I don't know, 15, 20 years, and I was just fresh out of college, not stepping on them, you know, stepping with them, Absolutely. working with them. So kind of giving them that autonomy to that, that everyone desires. Everybody likes a little bit of autonomy in what they do, but also you're not going to let them make, you know, that major mistake, you know, so you, you're kind of there to from a, from an oversight standpoint. Does that kind of summarize as well? That's correct. That's correct. I can just put a little a little example there. Um, it's not too old. The example is kind of recent. Kind of, I, I, I put into the practice some of the theory. We were working, uh, wiring up a few transmitters for one area of the, of the process. And, you know, it's kind of a common practice that you ground systems, right? So... You ground point A, you ground point B, but sometimes when you are working with 4 to 20 milliamp signal, that ground might become an issue more than, you know, might become a problem more than something that will help you. So I explain them, you know, you can now ensure that point A and point B will have the Saxon ground. So to avoid any ground current, you just hook up one end and the other one, you just cut it off or you step it out. So, okay. So that guy has been doing that for years. And he said, you know, I remember a couple of times people saying that they were seeing weird signals, weird values every once in a while. And he wondered, maybe it's because I hooked that ground in both ends. So that was, you know, making click on, on their minds. Absolutely. That's a great story, Luis. I mean, it just goes to show you, 
you listen, you care, and then you, you it goes back to that teacher. Yeah, exactly. The, the heart yeah. of a teacher. If you got that, you're you're, you're going to be a, a great leader. You know, if you were to think about, you, I know you had a lot of cool projects that uh, that you've been involved with. If you were to think about a highlight, anything stand out from your from your working career? I would say probably the current protection relay project that I'm doing, that I'm finishing is a project that the concept kind of was born back in, I would say, 2013 or so, based on uh, some observations that I did. And also we brought somebody from the outside to, to help us understand exactly what we had and what we should do. The, the thing that probably you've heard multiple times in the industry Sometimes it's hard to justify what you are proposing to do until something happens. And then that probably becomes an uh, urgency and it has to be done really quick. So finally, we started doing this project back in 2018. And here we are, 2020, still doing it, but with a way safer place for the process so we can keep running and to protect also our people that uh, work around this uh, big electrical equipment. No doubt. I mean, that sounds like a great project and I know you're, you got so much invested in it and you're uh, come a long way. So hats off to you there, Luis. And uh, one thing we love to do on these hero episodes is, is give a chance to give that shout out to somebody who's helped you in your careers, whether there be a, a mentor or influencer, I- any people come to mind there? I would say probably the first people that I worked with when I started in Arauco back in uh, back in Chile because they let me in their world. I learned a lot from them and we I think we developed a really really good team. Okay. So that that, that group was back in Chile you say? Yeah, back in Chile in the Tupan plant of uh, Arauco in, uh, in Chile. Very good. Very good. So maybe kind of give us a a little bit to what you're what you're studying right now. Anything that is in front of you? I know you got this project going on, but Mm -hmm. what are you curious about? It's going to be completely off topic, um, but um, kind of starting or learning two things. One that uh, I'm practicing, I would say kind of every day. Um, I have the opportunity. It's, it's not the device is not mine. It's a company device, but I'm being using it to to get some benefits out of it. I'm learning how to fly a drone. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Uh, taking photos, you know, videos, pictures of areas of the of the plant for inspections. You know, sometimes it's really hard to get a really tall man lift, and you know, getting a crane and basket to go. I don't know, two hundred feet in the air. When I can go straight up with a drone and take a picture, you know, fly around and then review it. And maybe later we can just, you know, bring the uh, right resources to fix it, whatever. And the other thing is, uh, based on the COVID situation, I'm learning how to cut hair. How to cut my own hair and how to cut the hair of my two kids, my two boys. Wow, man. I tell you what. So that's funny you said that because with COVID right now. Uh, I have I have a house full of women. I have my wife, a eight year old, and a nine year old, and then I have two dogs that need haircutting too. So I've learned over the last couple of weeks how to be a very experienced dog groomer and hairstylist. So <laughs> I actually, my wife asked me to cut her hair, Luis, and I'm oh like, boy. she is nine months pregnant. I'm like, are you sure this is just not the, uh, you know, the hormones talking here? You really want me to cut your hair? <laughs> she said, absolutely. So we uh, we braved it. And uh, my daughters, they saw it. They were like, we want our hair like that. I'm like, okay, here we go. So we just lined them up and just uh, just let it just let it rise. So uh, hats off to you on the on the haircutting, man. We, we got to do what we got to do, right? Exactly, exactly. At least I started with myself, use clippers and scissors. So I can say I still have hair and I still have my two ears. So that gave me the bravery or, or you know, maybe brave enough to go with my uh, two boys. 
So I would say I succeeded. After two weeks, I'm kind of seeing, yeah, it's not even here. I might improve it here, you know, in two more weeks. But yeah, I'm looking forward to the next one. That's right. I mean, well, it's the engineering in us, I think, too. You know, I, I told my wife, so she, she, we cut it and then she came out and, you know, after she had it fixed and I saw a few things, I'm like, oh, we got to go back. She's like, well, why? I'm like, because you had an OCD engineer cut your hair. <laughs> there are things that I have to get right. And uh, it's just, it's funny, but uh, you know, we do, what we got to do in, in these times, but uh, hats off to you. And the drone sounds like a ton of fun, man. So you've been able to yeah. actually bring that into the industrial environment and use it. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's actually a heritage from another, another plant. They used it. And now it's, uh, it's ours. I think I would say in, in our, in our plant here. So, I think it was in Taiwan has the the pilot for it. So <laughs> I've been learning. I, I, I've used it a couple of times. I've taken a, f- a few pictures and videos, still learning, still learning, trying to get, you know, smooth turns or what I want to focus on one object, flying around, moving all probably three controls that I can do. So I can, I can keep my object in the center of the, of the image. So still learning. That's great, man. That's great. And you know, we, we, we've talked about it a few times when we're in COVID. I'm just curious from your standpoint with COVID, uh, what do you see as a potential way to use technology in the future in regards to manufacturing? Well, support, which is a current uh, added value that is out there and that we use, and I know a lot of people use, you know, remote support, basic weather is, IT, whether it is automation, power systems to troubleshoot remotely or help the people that is in the plant that sometimes they're so pressured to get the plant back and back up and running and they don't know exactly what happened with remote access, that helps a lot. No doubt, no doubt. That remote access is it's critical and and we've actually had several episodes that that we're working on and from remote access to cybersecurity because w- with that remote access a whole new level of security comes into play right so we we've kind of we've talked about that as well cuz i think that's something that uh we're going to have to embrace manufacturing is changing i mean just just from a, a ways that vendors engage on site you know it, mm-hmm. w- once we get past covid that's going to be a new you know, a new venture there. What what do you what are you seeing or thinking with from that standpoint? How do you see as you know partners being able to engage with you on site? You know, how does that work in right now? Well, right now we have restricted access to to the site from anybody that is not really needed to be there, whether it's contractor or just vendors in general. To be honest, I don't know. I haven't I haven't thought on that yet. We're just receiving a lot of offers to give remote support to different types of products or different areas of the plant where we need sometimes specialty help. Right. Absolutely. You know, we've heard some we've had a, a few guests when they're talking about, you know, doing mandatory temperature screening, you know, amplified the the hand washing, you know, restrictions and requirements, uh, you know, a lot more of signage from a PPE standpoint and, and identifying social distancing. So I was just curious if any of that has has worked its way to the plant yet, but I'm sure if it hasn't yet, it it's coming. It most likely will be. I mean, we apply thermal imaging to our process. We have some of that equipment in place. So it's just a matter of deciding kind of, you know, where we want to install those devices to start tracking. And if something comes up, you know, you can program an alarm or something or a siren or something to say, you know, this person ten- person's temperature is too high. Let's look into it. Right. So, Luis, what do you, what, what do you wish you had more time to do at work, man? Spend a little less time in the computer. <laughs> okay. So would that be, if you're less time at the computer, more time on projects themselves or with people? Let me rephrase that. Less time in meetings. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Less time in meetings. Because computer work is necessary. I do 
a lot of computer work, whether I am reviewing projects, I'm making drawings, reviewing drawings, programming some devices. But yeah, sometimes I think we we don't we waste a little time in meetings whether it's in the way how we conduct the meetings or we just have too many i think uh, i think if we listen real close we'll hear all our listeners eco ask why just give you a big amen on that one you know that is <laughs> it's across the board man it's crazy it's i listen to an influencer and he talks about you know we have these half hour meetings if it's if it could be done in a seven minute meeting let it be done in a seven minute meeting and go on, you know, and if it needs to be longer, uh, then, then go. But, you know, the, the thoughts of we got to put, you know, an hour or 30 minutes on every meeting, you know, some stuff you can just crank out, you know, but it's just breaking that, that old mentality, you know? Yeah. We will break you, Luis. I'm confident. Just, we got to, we got <laughs> to stay together, my man. So let Let's take a turn outside of the plant for a minute. And, you know, you've talked about some some great things outside of work with the drone and cutting hair, things like that. What other hobbies do you got? I don't have any specific hobby, but I, I enjoy riding bike with my kids, playing a little basketball, a little soccer here and there. I'm seeing in my, my little granny his eyes when he discovered things. He's really from... He's, uh, he has uh, autism, so for him, the journey is being different in some areas, or sometimes it's been a little more difficult, but seeing him thrive is being the greatest that I experienced probably in the last couple of years. Now, you said that's your three-year-old? Three-year-old, yes. Okay, and you had, was it, I'll make sure I got my note, you had three children? Three children, my daughter, the, the oldest, she's 10. I said nine at the beginning, but she's 10, sorry. She'll kill me <laughs> if, I, if I say she's nine. My other little one is six, and uh, the youngest one is three. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like you got a great family there, Luis, and a lot of a lot of fun things going on there. So here's a here's a kind of a fun, a fun question. If you had a big, big bucket of cash that just dro- got dropped in your lap, where would you put that at? Probably, I would say, first thing, so I can be done with it, pay off my house, save for education for the future for my three three kids, and then maybe um, putting some money aside for traveling, knowing the world when it's safe again. You got that right. And somewhere Dave Ramsey just stood up and said amen. So, hey, I hear you, man. That's a great place to uh to invest that money. And and one day those travel restrictions will be lifted and we'll be able to go have some fun, you know, out in this, this beautiful country again, you know, no doubt, no doubt. So maybe walk us through, man, what's a fun day for you? If you had to, to, to pitch a, to paint a perfect day, what does that look like for Luis? First of all, no alarm clock in the morning. (laughs) And I think after that, trying to have the little one waking up a little later, (laughs) <laughs> so we can enjoy a little more of sleep and then even though schedule or structure is necessary we think at home for 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 kids i don't know just maybe just plan to don't plan anything um see what the day looks like going out have fun um I don't know, something like that. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a, a simple guy that enjoys really simple things. There's nothing wrong with that, Luis. I loved your answer. I, you know, the, the alarm clock thing. I think <laughs> we all love to shoot that alarm clock in the morning sometimes. But, uh, you know, <laughs> sounds like a good day to me, man. Hopefully you get to do that, you know, sometime soon and get to enjoy that time with the family. You know, we kind of really like to to kind of wrap these, these uh, hero episodes up with – at Eco asks why getting to the purpose, you know, and understanding what drives people. And, mm-hmm. you know, that can be a very philosophical question or, or, you know, it could go as deep as you want or shallow too. So what would be Luis's why? You know, I think I have the luxury of doing really what I want, really what I like. I like the electrical or electronic engineering field 
whether it's a uh, motor application, whether it's a protection ready application, automation, programming, different devices. I enjoy seeing the effect of a little change in a little piece of ladder logic or in a little piece of code and see how that translates into mechanical action and that mechanical action, the effect that has in our product on our, on our process. I don't know, to me it's that. It's just that I, I have the luxury of doing what I like. Well, I mean, that's a great answer, Luis. And it sounds like you're very passionate about what you do. And, and that's it. When you, when you love what you do and you're passionate about it, really, there's no such thing as going to work. You're, 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 you're getting to, to do what you love. So hats off to you, my friend. <laughs> Thanks. And you know what? Sometimes at work, just because I'm so passionate and I try to make it perfect, way, uh, regardless if it's needed to be perfect or not, I try to make it perfect. I know it drives some people crazy sometimes. Just because I go back to the issue, I go back to the issue. Uh, it's, uh, for me, it's just hard to... I, I, I don't want to say it's hard for me to get a no as an answer, but I don't take it that easy. Right, absolutely. Well, Luis, I've enjoyed this conversation. I know you bring a, a ton of value to our listeners. You've definitely inspired some people. You inspired me. I mean, just, just hearing your story. Uh, hats off to you. I was asked to give you a personal shout out from from our friend, Mr. Mike Rath, and he wanted to just thank you for all you do with him. Uh, he's been on our uh, several episodes. So our listeners know who Mike is, and he really values your the friendship he has with you. So, again, thank you so much for, for taking the time with us, and I, I really hope you uh, have a great day. Thank you. I really, really enjoyed this time, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to to this uh, podcast podcast and uh thanks to mike for uh, suggesting me to be part of it absolutely thank you luis thank you thank you for listening to eco ask why this show is supported ad free by electrical equipment company eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.